Well, Pete, it's November, so this means longer nights, but colder nights are here. But uh, plenty to see this month. Let's start off as we usually do with the inner solar system. So the planet Mercury at the start of November, it's around magnitude minus 1.0. That's quite bright, but it rises less than 30 minutes before the sun in the morning sky. Yeah, it's not well placed, actually, is it? No. It's not going to be well placed throughout the entire month because uh, it reaches superior conjunction on the 16th of November. And then when it comes back into the evening sky, it's not particularly well placed. And the same is true with Venus, actually, because Venus passed superior conjunction on the 22nd of October, and it remains too close to, to the sun to be seen properly, really. Um, so I think the inner solar system is a bit of a dead loss. I know you're the director of the BAA <laughs> Mercury section, is it? <laughs> Even I have to admit that at the moment they're not really putting on much of a show, so uh, that's fine. Venus, of course, will become a good target later on in the year uh, when in January, February, when it's much higher in the sky and much yes. further away from the sun. But for now, you're quite right. Inner solar system isn't much happening. However, if we look further afield, the red planet Mars, this is becoming quite a viable target oh, yes. now. At opposition next month, and it rises now at around 1845 UT at the start of November, and it's able to reach its highest position in the sky. So Duke South as darkness falls all month. So this is really... If you haven't started on Mars, and I can't imagine why not, now's the time to make a, make a start on observing it. It catches up with you, doesn't it? It really does sort of get good really quickly. And from the centre of the UK, it actually rises to an altitude when due south of 62 degrees. That's really... Practically overhead. Practically overhead. Practically overhead. <laughs> <laughs> it does feel like that. <laughs> it, do, it does from your garden because um, you've got that valley behind you. And, of course, anything even remotely higher up in the sky looks like it's almost overhead. But uh, I was observing Mars uh, the, in September, and even then, when it was in Taurus, it, it was it was notable just how high up. Yes. Because we've had planets low down for so long, having Mars this high in the sky is really quite wonderful. Um, as you say, on the 1st of November... Uh, it rises about 1845, but it presents a disc with an apparent diameter of a massive 15 arc Woo seconds. It is quite large, actually. Even a small telescope now will be showing detail. So I remember when I had a, a four-inch refractor, um, you could see the Certus Major and the polar yeah. caps when present with a well, uh, at, at that size. Well, let's put that in context, context because 15 arc seconds is about a... Um, it's about a a third the apparent size of Jupiter, isn't it? Yeah, so it's it's pretty good. So you'll see, and of course with Mars, it's I always think even though Jupiter is bigger and brighter, Mars has much more of a contrast against the dark albedo features. Yes. You know, the, the mark is really dark against the bright ochre deserts and the striking white clouds that form, they really do glint in the sunlight. So uh, it may be smaller, but you can see a little bit, I think it's easier to see the details. Well, I think the best thing to say is that if you're new to viewing Mars and you look at it <laughs> through a telescope, you're probably going to be disappointed. And the reason for that is not that Mars is rubbish, because it isn't, it's really good. It's because your expectations will be askew. Sorry, it's your fault. <laughs> uh, but basically, <laughs> you, you see pictures of Mars and you think that's what you're going to see through the eyepiece of a telescope. And it, it's not if you're not used to it. Your eye can't cope with the view of it very well. No, it takes time to get back into it. This is why I started my Mars observations in July, because it takes a while to get back into observing Mars. There's all sorts of little visual tricks you should use. You know, you've got to look at it for a long time. You've got to get the right magnification. You've got to make account of the seeing. If the seeing's bad, don't use a really high power because all it will do is amplify the distortion. That's quite There's right. all sorts of little techniques you have to do with Mars. And the earlier you start observing it, the more you're going to get out of your observing sessions closer, closer to opposition. The other problem, of course, with Mars is that a lot of the photographs you'll see of it, which people present are the ones which have got lots of lovely detail on them to present the like your images pete when you do them <laughs> <laughs> i never I, I don't do them anymore the um the <laughs> that's not true <laughs> no the, the the ones which have got loads of lovely contrasty detail but of course there are two sides to mars well there are three sides to mars really i suppose um but the there are two sides or two bits of Mars which have got lots and lots of detail on them and there's one side of Mars which has got very little on it and if yeah. you happen to time it really badly and you know if you're trying for the first time that's probably going to be the case yeah um, 
it hasn't got any detail on that particular area. Well, it has, but it's really difficult to see. It's, it's right at the far south, and unless the tilt is a southerly tilt, you just got a thin line at the very top of the disc and very little else on it, yeah. yeah. And, of course, if you're really unfortunate and try again, and it's exactly three weeks later, you'll see the same side of Mars again. So, yeah, it can, it can, but it is, I go back to my point, Pete, it is worth the effort of putting it in uh, and get, getting the time to observe it and building up your oh, observing skills. Oh, absolutely. Because when it is at our position, it is glorious. I've seen Mars, actually, through almost perfect seeing, and it was... Uh, it just sort of stopped me in my tracks to see it. Yeah, It was incredible detail. So plenty to see there on Mars, and this is something we'll keep an eye on, and of course we'll talk about it again in the VP next month because we don't just have our position, we also have an occultation of, of, uh, of the Moon by Mars as well. But moving out now, uh, the evening planet Jupiter is still there, still well positioned uh, throughout November. Yes. Uh, on the night of the 4th to the 5th of November, Jupiter is joined by an 86 percent lit waxing gibbous moon uh but jupiter's actually been a very interest of late because uh, i i i'm seeing more and more detail on it because there's more and more cloud belts seem to be taking up uh space in jupiter's south tropical zone the great red spot is now very small and quite dark um there seems to be interesting changes happening on the planet and this is worth following also, of course, Jupiter reaches perihelion when it's closest to the sun very early next year. And that means that um, close to opposition, it's a little bit closer to us, yes. which is, is making a difference. It's actually shining away at about magnitude minus 2.7 on the 1st of November, which is pretty bright for Jupiter. It is. It's is very bright, actually. And uh, one thing I've noticed this time around, this apparition, uh, with my 12-inch Newtonian, we had really almost perfect seeing here uh, on a night in September. And the first thing that I noticed after I'd made my observations of Jupiter was just how sharp the moons were, the four Galilean satellites. Oh, yes. Uh, they were perfect round disks. And I put a power of time 600 onto the telescope and looked at Ganymede, the largest of the satellites, which is larger than the Ganet, uh, it's larger than the planet Mercury. Yes. Uh, and it did seem to be some some subtle shading that was just on the edge of detection. I have no idea whether that was a contrast effect or a real effect, but checking when Jupos later, there was a similar feature in about the region I'd drawn. I don't hold that as conclusive proof that I saw the stuff on Ganymede. Well, that's, uh, but it is interesting yeah. to note that that opportunity has presented itself because Jupiter has come to opposition close to perihelion. Well, they are certainly um, viable imaging targets. You can image detail on them if you get good steady seeing. So, yeah, I, I don't see why not visually if you've got a really good night. It's waiting for those moments of perfect seeing, which is really important. Um, yeah, once a year I get. I once think a year. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Um, and Jupiter at the moment, of course, is very close to the circlet asterism in Pisces. Uh, that Not that you're going to need that to find <laughs> Jupiter because you could hardly see the circlet. You, you probably need Jupiter to find the circlet in Pisces, <laughs> actually. <laughs> that's very true. Um, Saturn, then, that's still reasonably well placed. It's never particularly high this past year, although it is getting higher, so we have been getting more excited about it. But every year that passes now, we'll, it will get better. Um, but as it gets to peak altitude due south it will be about 21 degrees up. So it's, it's nothing amazing there, but... Um, it's better than previous. I already have more than half a dozen drawings of Saturn. That is something that shows just how much better it is compared to, oh dear, when it a couple of years ago when it was hidden permanently by houses and treetops and Well, things. it was in the low low teens, wasn't it? It was it about was. 13 degrees, it yes. It was. It was the lowest I'd ever seen it. So, yeah, things are improving. 55% uh, lit waxing gibbous moon actually lies near Saturn uh, start of the month on the 1st of November and a lovely 39% lit waxing crescent on the evening of the 29th of November. So those would be nice as well if you can catch them. Absolutely. Well, Uranus reaches opposition in early November, so that will mean that the planet will be at its best as seen from Earth. And I wouldn't hold out a great deal of hope, <laughs> hope for a massive improvement because it's a really distant world and opposition doesn't really make a huge amount of difference to its appearance. Having said that, if you get a good 
night of steady seeing. It's well worth looking at the planet through a, a large telescope with a high magnification because you can see banding on it sometimes, can't you? Sometimes, yeah. I've no. I think the banding I've seen on it, which I've never seen in anything less than an eight-inch telescope on a good night, and my twelve-inch telescope on a good night as well. Uh, it, it's kind of, in many ways, it's similar to the cloud markings of Venus. You know, you've seen something, but yes. you're not sure what. Yes. Uh, and uh, I, you know, a good test is to actually make a drawing and then go back inside and compare it with WinDuPass, the free planetarium software, or indeed any other planetary software, because that will show you the orientation. That's and if your the key. Yes. Banding matches the genuine curvature of the rotor uh, that Uranus is presenting. Then you probably have seen something. If it's at ninety degrees to what Uranus is actually doing, then no, you haven't. So, uh, but it's not impossible, as you say. Um, times four hundred on a twelve-inch telescope. The disk is certainly large enough to see something, and it may just take the form of a, a subtle brighter region or bright or darker shading over the poles, uh, but it, it's certainly possible on a good night. But you have to bear in mind that Uranus has an apparent diameter of 3.8 arc seconds when it's at opposition, which is, you know, it's it's not minuscule. It's bigger than the moons of Jupiter. Yeah, and, and the thing is that the planet you know you might be struggling to see detail on it or you might be struggling to image detail on it but it's a pretty bland world at the best of times it doesn't show a lot of detail does it no not really um you you, you can use a red filter to try and see more of the banding apparently that brings it out i've never had a lot of luck with that personally because my red filter uh ratten 23 i think I think that's the number. Uh, it doesn't transmit a lot of light. No. So as soon as you put a filter on visually, you're losing a lot of light. So any detail that there that might be emphasised by the filter is lost by the fact that it's not transmitting as much light, so the image is fainter. Yes. So is there some payoffs to that? I do. I think infrared imaging, uh, it probably you have more success with picking up banding on the planet. Definitely. Well, Uranus is currently shining at around magnitude plus 5.6, which means, I mean, it's always on the, the threshold of naked eye visibility, but 5.6 is actually reasonably bright um, compared to, well, I say reasonably bright, it's about 0.1 of a magnitude brighter than it would normally be, but it's probably worth having a go if you've never seen it before um, using your eyes from a dark sky site and seeing whether you can spot it just to say you've done it. Yeah, I never have. I've never been able to see it. Okay, well, Neptune remains well-placed for UK observation, able to reach its peak altitude due south under dark sky conditions all month long. This one you do need optical assistance with. Binoculars probably the best way because it's magnitude plus 7.9. Uh, Mag 7.9, Neptune and minus 2.5 Jupiter, there's a big difference there, will appear 6.1 degrees apart mid-month. That'd be nice. So again, you could use Jupiter to find Neptune. <laughs> what, what does that mean? That'll be nice. Well, it will be, because finding <laughs> Neptune, if you've not done it before, isn't, isn't easy. So having a giant beacon like Jupiter nearby is a nice way of doing it. Okay. <laughs> ah, please yourself. All right, so we have some specials this month. The one on the first is that there are two first quarter moons in November this year, and today at 0638, and that next one is on the end of the month, 30th of November at 1437. So those are the two quarter moons. When uh, you have two two full moons in a month, the second one is incorrectly referred to as a blue moon. So I wonder if this is going to be a blue first quarter moon. Why must you add to the burgeoning nonsense that exists already? There's <laughs> <laughs> absolutely no need. Moving on to something far more interesting, we have lots of Jupiter moon events coming up, and I love these. I know there's no scientific value in them at all, but they are very pretty to watch. Um, they are. The first one on the 2nd of November, Europa and Ganymede transit Jupiter's disk together. That's quite unusual to get a Ganymede one, because Ganymede is much further out. Uh, and takes quite a while to orbit uh, Jupiter. So getting Ganymede and another satellite is uh, it is quite unusual. So that, it is. Uh, yes. that's, that's one to watch for. Uh, be, they start their transit at about 2044 UT. Well, on the 6th, an early view of Jupiter through a telescope will reveal the giant moon Ganymede emerging from Jupiter's shadow. That's always quite impressive, actually. Um, Ganymede reappears from uh, Jupiter at 1649 UT, 1.1 arc minutes to the east of the planet. And if you've got 
a high magnification setup or a high image scale imaging setup, it's worth having a go for this and see whether you can detect curvature of Jupiter's shadow on the Moon's disk. Yeah, I've, I've never seen it, but then I've never seen Ganymede properly emerge from shadow. I've always been interrupted by clouds or yes. um, they've had, or, or the seeing's not been good enough, particularly when the uh, planet's lower down. But I, I should think if it is, you know, good seeing and Jupiter's high up, then a reasonable magnification, you will see the planet, uh, you will see the moon emerging and you might catch the curvature of the shadow. I think you'd certainly catch it with imaging and it'd be an interesting observation to make. I've, I have done it before. I've done an animation of that and it is quite interesting. You can see the, the shape very clearly. Yeah, so that's a good one. Um, having said that Ganymede transits are rare, we have another one on the 10th, <laughs> both Europa and Ganymede again. So if you didn't catch it on the 2nd, you can have a go on the 10th. Both transit Jupiter together in the morning. So both moons will start transiting at about 19 minutes past midnight uh, UT. And this will carry on until 0138 UT with Europa's shadow joining the party at about 5 past 1 in the morning. On the night of the 18th into the morning of the 19th, the outer Galilean moon Callisto will undergo a very close pass of Jupiter's northern limb between 2305 UT on the 18th and 0015 UT on the 19th. There's nothing particularly special about that apart from the opportunity to see Callisto close to Jupiter. It's the outermost of the four Galileans and it takes a while to sort of get into that position. Yeah, Callisto is an interesting moon, I've always thought. And it's interesting because it's not very interesting. All the other moons, <laughs> I owe you. That's a bit like you. <laughs> <laughs> I, I take my cue from you, Pete. <laughs> It is the case that all the other satellites, Io, Europa, Ganymede, they are, you know, rich in either volcanic activity or cryovolcanism. There's clearly a lot going on. Oh yes, but, but Callisto is just completely dead. It's not a lot to it. So uh, yeah, Callisto is interesting because it's dull, just like you, Pete. <laughs> All right, we've got one more, uh, uh, one more uh, Galilean phenomena happening on the twentieth. Ganymede is occulted by Jupiter, and this starts at twenty-seven minutes past five as Europa's shadow is in transit. So you'll should see a black speck of the shadow uh, on Jupiter's disk. Uh, this is a virtual repeat of this event because on the twenty-seventh of November. Uh, and on the 27th, Ganymede will again be occulted by Jupiter's northwest limb uh, from 2108 onwards. So that's a, another interesting one to watch out for. They get hard, actually, don't they, when the moons are very close to the limb. They sort of yeah. mer merge into the limb. The limb doesn't appear sharp like you would expect. It's sort of, because of the seeing, it becomes quite fuzzy. Yeah, they, lose... can be, they become a bit of amorphous blobs together, don't they, when it's really... Glad good description it. i like that i'm okay. trying to keep it simple <laughs> <laughs> okay well on the third um we're going back in time now now we've done all the jupiter moon events but on the third of november there's a popular and easy to see clear obscure effect known as the jeweled handle this is when the dawn lunar light catches the curved arc of the Jura mountain range and it appears to extend off into the dark of the lunar night. It's quite a pretty thing to see, actually. You can see that with it binoculars. Is. Yeah. Yes, it is very pretty. Um, on the 7th, uh, well, in fact, over the next few nights, uh, dwarf planet Ceres will pass through the Leo triplet. Uh, these are the galaxies M65, M66, and NGC 3628. Uh, that's quite a nice thing to watch, isn't it? I've never seen that before, so I should be keeping a look at. No, it's interesting. Interesting to see that. Um, another interesting thing, which has no scientific relevance whatsoever, <laughs> is that on the 10th of November, the bright planet Mars, which will appear really bright, will have roughly the same right ascension as Ulnilam, which is the centre star in Orion's belt. So it'll be vertically above Ulnilam in the sky. Right. I'll make a note of that. Or, or I should say, not, not vertically above, because that depends what time of night you're looking. Yes. It'll be due, due north, that's what I should due say. Due north, the same right ascension. Okay. On yes. the 17th, of course, we have our annual Leonid meteor shower. I don't mean as in hours as in we put it on, but it is an annual <laughs> meteor shower. It's quite a good one, isn't it, the Leonids? It it's, peaks on the 17th um, into the morning of the 18th. It gets a good press, the Leonids, but... 
falsely, I think. I mean, the, Le- <laughs> the, the Leonids... Can't ban Sandy Joy, how do you think, can you at all? <laughs> no, no, the reason for that is that the Leonids is not a strong meteor shower most of the time, but every 33 no. years it does go into storm mode and it, it produces thousands, if not tens of thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of meteors an hour. Um, but... We are away from that at the moment. The last one was 20, uh, 1999 into the year 2000. So it'll next next one's 30 years away. And it's will it be clear? Will it happen on, when it's daylight in the well, UK? Well, it's 2033, 20, the next one. So we're in the middle right. at the moment. The Leonids, I mean, they you can get some really nice bright events with them. They're really swift meteors. They're the swiftest, I think, in the sky that occur throughout the year. The entry rate for the Leonid meteoroids is something like 77 kilometres a second, which is pretty right. pretty fast. Uh, but this year, we'll have a 33% lit waning crescent moon located within Leo at the time of the peak. So that will cause a degree of interference. Yeah, so a bit of a nuisance there. Uh, on the 18th, uh, though, something interesting does happen on the moon, and that's the libration is relatively favourable to view the Mare Orientale. This is a massive ringed uh, basin on the far side of the moon. It's called the Mare Orientale because in days gone by, it was named the Eastern Sea because it was on the eastern limb of the moon, but the IAU reversed the directions, in the I think in the 50s or early 60s, so the That's Mare right. Orientale now lies on the western limb of the moon. Yeah. I, I remember Patrick never being terribly happy about that. Oh, I can imagine that completely. <laughs> yes, the eastern moon on the western <laughs> side. The other thing about Mare Orientale is the fact that it's often described as this big concentric ringed basin, but it, that's not it. It's the bit in the middle, right in the middle, which is yeah. Mary Orientale. The rings are concentric mountain ranges. Yeah, in fact, that's the Rook Mountains, isn't it? That's, uh, uh, one of them is the uh, Monts Rook, and there's Monts Cordillera as well. Right. And, and you've got various lakes in there as, as well. Lacus Autumni, I think, is one of them, the Lake of Autumn. That's quite appropriate, really, isn't it? Isn't it? That's good. <laughs> OK, well, the night sky, then, those are our special events. We've got uh, plenty to see also in the night sky. Uh, winter is now almost upon us. Uh, and to the east this month, we've got the magnificent constellation of Orion making its return to dominate the uh, winter skies. Yes. Spectacular group of seven stars with the uh, famous Orion's belt in the middle, very easily recognisable. Uh, hanging down from the belt, we've got uh, a lovely object to study. This is the Orion Nebula M42, a stellar nursery where stars are being born even as we speak. Um, now, you really do need a telescope or binoculars to see this nebulosity. Some say it's visible to the naked eye. It certainly looks unstellar. It doesn't look like a star to the naked eye, but I don't know whether you would say you could see the nebulosity with the naked eye. There are there are two, aren't there? There's uh, M42 and M8 in Sagittarius, so more or less on opposite part of the sky, which are supposed to be visible to the naked eye. I'm never convinced about M42 because the, the sword is full of little clusters and patches of stars. And I think I think it creates the impression that there is something there. Um, so I'm not sure you actually see the glow of the nebula with your eyes. But you can certainly see it with any instrument, binoculars, as you say, small telescope, large telescope. And it looks absolutely fantastic. It does. And to the west, we have the last vestiges of summer. We have Cygnus, which is taking a swan dive into the northwestern horizon. Very good. And dragging the Milky Way along with it. And this time of year, it's possible to see the Milky Way pass up from the northwest overhead through the constellations that are near the zenith, Cassiopeia and Perseus, and then down into the southeast, oh, yes. just to the left of the constellation of Orion. Although I always find the Milky Way as it cast, passes down through Orion, to be quite tricky, actually. It's nowhere near as striking as in the summer sky. It, well, that's right, because you're looking in the opposite direction um, to the core in the winter when you're looking at that bit of Milky Way next to Orion. Whereas in the summer, of course, when you see it near the teapot in Sagittarius, you're looking towards the core. So that bit is really bright. The bit next to Orion is really quite faint and um, difficult to make out. I should point out, actually, that there are two asterisms, aren't there? There's the Summer Triangle, which is the one which includes the brightest star in Cygnus, Deneb, and also um, Vega in Lyra the Lyre and Altair in Aquila the Eagle. That You can probably just about still see that 
in November. And you've also got the Winter Triangle, which is made from Procyon, which is the brightest star in Canis Minor, Sirius, the brightest star in Canis Major, and Betelgeuse, which is the, the orange or the red supergiant star, which sits in the upper left corner, or the northeast corner of Orion. And the Milky Way passes down through both of those triangles, which is rather convenient. It is, but it's much easier to see through the summer triangle than, than, than the winter one. Um, if you locate the familiar asterism that we've mentioned many times, the great square Pegasus, and find its upper left corner now, this is the star Alpha Rats, and there's a little wedge of stars just off to the upper left, and nearby here is the great Andromeda galaxy, M31, oh, yes. a huge uh, spiral galaxy larger than our own Milky Way, sub two and a half billion light years away. So the light we're seeing now left that galaxy two and a half million years ago. And it's unfortunate that a telescopic view is never quite as good as a digital photograph, because when you look at it through the telescope, you're just seeing the brighter core. Um, the, 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 the fainter arms are actually much further away and uh, harder to see unless you've got a really dark sky. It's a very funny deep sky object in that respect, because you see it with the naked eye from a... You don't have to have amazingly dark skies to pick it up, actually. And you think, wow, that looks amazing that's going to look incredible through a telescope <laughs> and it just looks like a brighter version of what you see with the naked eye really but if it's, it's an interesting point because you know i've looked at the andromeda spiral in successively larger telescopes in dark skies for around around the world and it never seems to change its view <laughs> <laughs> it looks the same in my eight inch as it does in the university's 20 inch and at a dark star dark sky star party i was at once at astronomy island it kind of always looks the same that bright core with a fuzzy bit it never seems to get any it's, better it, the trick is to view it with low power um because mm. there are there is stuff to be had there you've got the core and you can start to make out one of the darker dust lanes running through it, which then gives you a hint where the the outer arms are, but they are quite faint. Uh, the other things to look out for, of course, are M32, which is the bright yes. elliptical galaxy quite close to the core. And then you've got uh, M110, which is the other one, which is a bit further away on the other side. And that I always like that. That's quite uh, looks more elongated. Yeah, it's quite pretty, isn't it? So... Yes, uh, below Andromeda is Triangulum, the triangle. Uh, there's another nice spiral galaxy here. This is the M33 Triangulum galaxy. But That's this quite one, a toughie, yeah. This is a tough one because it's almost face-on to us. Um, so it's quite bright. Uh, it's listed as plus 5.7, so quite a bright object. <laughs> but you have to remember that, that that brightness is spread out over the large surface area. So if you do that, you actually get a very faint object. <laughs> Well, it's about a degree across, which is, you know, the moon is about half a degree across, so it's it's sort of twice the angular diameter of the moon. And yeah. Yeah, I mean, if you spread mag 5.7 out over that area, it's going to be really, really quite faint. I have seen it with the naked eye. I've seen the core with the naked eye from a very dark sky site, but it's tricky, it's very tricky. Even with binoculars, you know, it's very hard to pick out. Yeah. Triangulum is interesting, though, isn't it? It always, always makes me laugh because it's a group of three stars <laughs> which, for, which form ooh, a triangle. Yeah. Um, and it's it's always interesting to me because I wanted to find out what it meant. And it, it's actually supposed to represent the island of Sicily, which is sort of triangular-shaped. I didn't know that. There mm. we go. Moving on, below <laughs> Triangulum uh, lies a, a sort of crooked bent line of stars that form Aries the Ram, um, three main stars mark the front of the animal, which extends further to the east or to the left, if you prefer. Um, not a great deal to see here, but Gamma is worth a look. It's a lo it's rather a nice double star, actually. And it's, I think is it, it is one of the first ones that was ever discovered. Yes, it was. It was found by Robert Hooke in 1664 while he was following a comet. Right. Uh, the, the component stars, reasonably bright. They're both naked eye. They're plus 3.9 and plus 4.6 and they're separated by 7.6 arc seconds which isn't that challenging so that's quite a nice thing to look for i remember patrick actually describing aries he, he was always quite dismissive of the constellation because he said there's nothing in it at all to give it that's that's not exactly true. there are really faint galaxies but they're all pretty faint they are you say. need 
very large telescopes to be able to And Uranus to see. at the moment. Of Uranus. Course. Uranus is the only thing that perhaps makes Aries <laughs> worthwhile. <laughs> just, just, just to stick the knife in even further with Aries, the brightest star is Hamel, which is is regarded as a good comparison star because it's really boring. It's really average. It just <laughs> it doesn't do anything. It's got no characteristics to it at it's, all. It's the Callisto which... of the stars, is it? <laughs> <laughs> well put. Oh, dear. Well, Aries does border a much more impressive constellation. This is Taurus the Bull, uh, unmistakable at this time of year. Uh, yes. The Pleiades open cluster twinkling away in the sky there, and I always think whenever you see them in the sky, you know winter isn't far away. In fact, this cluster is surrounded by a reflection nebulae, and this a reflection nebulae is essentially cold dust, or it warms dust if it's right by the star, but essentially dust that's reflecting the light of yes. the stars, and that's what's providing this misty look which you, you see in long exposure photographs. And the, um, light, and the light which is reflected from it tends to be at the bluer end of the spectrum, so long exposure photographs show it as blue. In fact, for a long time, I remember when I started out in astronomy and those pictures came through showing the nebulosity. It's the last century. How de- well, it was actually, yes. Uh, <laughs> da- damn it. Um, the Yeah, when they spoke about um, the, sh- the dust enshrouding the Pleiades, they used to think it was the leftover material from the formation of the cluster. But then it was discovered by careful analysis that the proper motion of the dust is different to the proper motion of the cluster stars. So it's then deduced that the stars are moving through that, that dust cloud. But then it was found out that there were two dust clouds merging there, so they're all moving independently. So it's two dust clouds and the stars being there at the same time. Wow. So it's actually quite a complex story. Yes. It's interesting how many stories there are like that in astronomy, how when you first get started, people believe this, and then subsequent more observations and evidence have shown that that's not the case at all and something more complex is happening. That is the beauty of astronomy. You know, the stories are often far more complicated than you would actually expect yes so it's uh one of the reasons that makes the uh, the hobby so very interesting and um, the main star of taurus of course is the distinctive orange star known as aldebaran or the eye of the bull it's around 65 light years away and it will be passed by pioneer 10 in two million years time will you be observing that it'll be cloudy won't it i knew you were gonna <laughs> say that <laughs> it's actually um aldebaran is interesting because the name means follower Right. It's often said it, it means the eye of the bull, but it doesn't. It means follower. And um, I think there is an old English term for it, which was oculatori, which is the eye of the bull. Oh, okay. Uh, uh, but, uh, yeah, follower because it's supposed to follow the Pleiades. It, that's what it's believed it means, across the sky. Right. Okay. Well, you can follow the arms of the V to the east and you'll come to the tips of uh, the bull's horns. Uh, the upper star, Almath, this is interesting because it used to belong to the constellation of Auriga, but now belongs to uh, Taurus instead. Uh, look on a modern star chart and you'll not be able to locate Gamma Aurigae, and that's because it was redesignated Beta, Tauri or Almath. So a little bit of interesting history there. The southern star or southern uh, bull's horn tip is marked by zeta tauri do you know what the name of zeta tauri is i really wish i hadn't asked this because you're not going to know and i'm going to have to say it oh that's the only reason you actually asked isn't it <laughs> uh, i don't know i don't know it pete it's tian wan okay and which it is means I believe it means the gate to the stars or something like that. It's the... Um, what do you mean the... you believe? You, you, you can't build it up and then not know. <laughs> <laughs> it's, well, I think it's a, a reasonably recent um, addition to the star names because I, I've never known it to have a name. And that's the Chinese name for it, which I think is rather nice that we've got a, a Chinese name in there, uh, especially as that star is really the marker where you yes. start to find a very famous deep sky object, which is M1, the Crab Nebula, which is a the remnant of a supernova which was seen uh, to explode from Earth in 1054 AD, and it was ancient Chinese and Arabic astronomers that recorded it. Yes, it's uh, quite an interesting object. Uh, the crab itself is quite a difficult object to see. Again, it's one of these objects that's quite bright but has a big surface area, so difficult to pick up. But uh, 
I've never seen the Central Star yet. Um, Have you not? No, it's on my list of things to do. Uh, I think it's probably difficult to see with an eight-inch telescope from a city. So, uh, what I, I don't think it's that difficult, actually. I, I, think I, I have to have another go. It's been many years since I've tried, but I, I, it's this one on the list that I want to get. Because um, it, we should explain that this is the remnant of the supernova explosion, and the the, the star which Paul is talking about is a neutron star. It's a star which um, has collapsed in on itself, basically. That's right. And incredibly massive, incredibly heavy, but it's probably about 30 kilometres across. So it's it's not particularly large. And it spins very fast, and it has hot spots on its surface due to intense magnetic fields. And those hot spots flash past us, and they give us a pulse every 33 milliseconds. And that is an example of an object known as a pulsar. Yeah, and there's quite a few of them dotted around the night sky. Uh, these are radio sources. Some of them spin incredibly quickly. Uh, yes. But they are also cosmic clocks in a sense in that that periodicity is very, very regular and they, they keep to it. So they, they, they can often be used for, for that point of view. Yeah, well, that, that's a fantastic thing to look for and probably a, a good place to draw our tour of the November night sky to a conclusion. So... Go outside, try and see some of the things we've mentioned, and I wish you clear skies. Thank you very much, Paul. Thanks, Pete.